At EarthQ, we are dedicated to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion because at the heart of EarthQ is people. I hope each of you feels welcome and excited to be part of this vibrant community. This statement comes directly from the work of our diversity, equity, and inclusion working group, and is an example of how our initiative is for the community led by the community. For EarthCube to be a productive and innovative group, it's essential that it be a safe, inclusive space. Outside of the technical and career benefits, it should be a place that you're glad to spend your time. And so I remind you that we have a community code of conduct, sorry, community participation guidelines, getting used to the new terms, that you can find on our website. And we have st several strategies for upholding community standards in the online meeting areas. So please alert us if you see anything amiss. For those of you new to EarthCube, it is an initiative sponsored by the National Science Foundation aimed at benefiting geoscientists and the wider research community through tools, methods, standards, architectures, and community connections. EarthCube has joined programs and other directorates at NSF to invest in additional projects that bring the total EarthCube investment close to $200 million, including in institutions like UNAVCO, UCAR, and ICSI. Over the last eight years, NSF has funded over 75 workshops, more than 80, 85 projects, and three support offices. From the funded projects to the community and governance groups, these activities are aimed to foster a better understanding of our complex and changing planet. Something that is very special and unique about EarthCube is that it's a place where geoscientists and builders can come together to innovate and create. Here's a survey done by our science engagement team this year who looked at currently funded projects and how EarthCube impacted their collaborations. From new collaborators to if any were students, as well as to if that led to collaborations and funding outside of EarthCube. I think this shows you that EarthCube is a place that's all about collaboration, plugging students into research, and that people do great things together from there. Here's a snapshot of the people assem assembled this year. It's hard to know because you can't see how big the virtual room is, at least not in the opening plenary, but we have over 400 people registered, including half uh, who are attending for the first time. 40% are early career. Most of you tuning in don't have current EarthCube funding. And I think this is an important statistic because it tells us that people aren't here because they feel obligated to be, but it's because you're getting something out of being part of this community and this annual gathering. While most aspects of not being able to meet in person have been difficult, one of the huge positives is our ability to include people in other countries. And we have people from 22 countries tuning in this week. Thank you to those of you who are up, are up early or for whom it's the middle of the night. And I know I, I saw a few of you in the chat. It's, it's very late and thank you so much for being with us. We are all very excited you joined us today. This is our annual touch point that allows for our community to gather as well as a chance for us, the EarthCube leadership and governance to hear from all of you and to learn. It gives us an intentional way to promote our shared values. And one thing that binds EarthCube members together is our commitment to early career and student researchers and making sure that EarthCube is a place for you at any stage in your career, as well as a place that helps you to grow your career. And of course, we love to learn about new technologies and technical innovations from our funded projects, as well as new endeavors on the horizon. Here is the agenda for this session, and you'll be glad to know that you're almost through the first part. You will hear from the EarthCube Office Technical Lead, Kenton McHenry, who will talk about geocodes, your leadership council chair, Mike Daniels, with governance updates, the co-chair of our EDI committee, Denise Hills, and our colleagues, Keith Mall and Matt Naranick, who from NCAR, who have been tracking EarthCube's scholarly impact. Then last but not least, you will hear from our program officer, Dr. Eva Zanzerkia, and we will have ample time for questions. This is your EarthCube office, the backbone organization of EarthCube. As um, we gather for the next three days, many of us have this background so that you can identify people from the office and um, don't, don't be shy to ask us questions uh, or let us know if we can help with the experience of the annual meeting. We are primarily based at the San Diego Supercomputer Center and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, with partners at several institutions, including NCSA and ESIP. A huge heap of credit goes to our EarthCube Office Director, Lynn Schreiber, 
in the Earth Cube cabinet that includes Dr. Ken McHenry, Dr. Karen Stocks, and Dr. Kathy Constable. The Eco Cabinet guides all of this, uh, and they are here uh, listed at the top. We have a group of people who, though in most cases give a small slice of their time, are completely dedicated to supporting the community's needs, ranging from technical pilots and support to advice on making your data fair, to writing stories about your research outcomes, and finding ways to promote the good work of the community through events, conferences, and our data help desk. We work alongside the governance structure that Mike will speak about later this hour. ECO has been hard at work. Our science engagement team has worked with funded projects to onboard them, to hold interviews so we can understand their needs and refer them to resources, as well as working with our council of funded projects on project summaries and videos. Another part of the team has created a set of fair resources as well as the jargon list you see, see some of you saw in the mailed packet of materials. We held two virtual data help desks since we last met and shared not quite 80 resources in 600 posts. Our, our science writer has written 13 feature articles that have reached approximately 4,000 eyeballs. Earlier this spring, the office underwent a detailed midterm management review and came out of it with flying colors where the panel found that we were meeting the core expectations that included transparency, responsiveness, community leadership, inclusiveness, effectiveness and efficiency, and accountability. This was in large part to the wonderful partnership that we have with all of you in the community and our governance. We also received extremely helpful input about how to help the community transition many activities so that they live on past EarthCube. Looking ahead to the next year, we will have more support uh, of the funded projects. We've already held five roundtables and have more planned as well as onboarding of newly funded projects and catching up with existing ones. On our slate for new guidance documents, we have things on software and data citation, ethical considerations such as the care principles, which you'll hear about tomorrow afternoon. And we will also transition from holding data help desks to assisting with groups who want to organize their own. One of the outgrowths of the consultation with funded projects spawned this idea of webinars and usability and sustainability that projects are craving. Again, an area of special emphasis for EarthCube and the governance team is an interest in supporting our early career folks and students. So two quick opportunities I'd like to tell you about. If you don't know about the Earth Science Information Partners, they're not just an important partner of the ECO, but also of great interest to our community and we want to make sure that EarthCube is well represented in the applicable clusters and has learning and outreach opportunities for the good work you're doing. To that end, we are partnering with ESIP to cover some EarthCube member registrations. And you will see some more information in the chat and also for those of you who signed up for the EarthCube Slack channel. A second opportunity in this year's, uh, for this year's informal mentoring is going to happen at the Gather Town Beach. And this will be during the coffee breaks and during the poster sessions. So if you're early career or students, or if you're someone who'd like to be a mentor, please head over to the beach to meet new colleagues. Okay, well, now that you're caught up on uh, science engagement and the office, uh, I'd like to invite Kenton McHenry, who leads the technical team, to say more about geocodes and what their team's been up to. Uh, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. Not quite in presenter mode. There we go. Perfect. So I'm Kenton McHenry and I'm serving as the technical lead for the EarthCube Eco office. I wanted to first highlight the team. It's made up of a, a number of folks uh, across a variety of disciplines spanning geoscience, uh, DevOps, uh, back end development, front end development, uh, and uh, a new kind of area for some of these activities, uh, UI UX, uh, user interface, user experience kind of aspect of things. And, and uh, not all these people are 100% on, on this effort, of course. You know, there's fractions of times across uh, different priorities as need be. Uh, and, uh, but I would like to point out that we do have a, a, a good background with regards to supporting NSF software cyber infrastructure efforts uh, delineated by this diagram in the background with regards to kind of the, the DIBS roadmap that was laid out some years back uh, as part of that effort. Um, 
So what I want to point out is one of the things that uh, we've been dealing with with regards to Earth Cube is with regards to its funded efforts uh, and the activities it, 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 it supports. Uh, there have been 85 funded efforts to date uh, around things to develop tools, data resources, infrastructure, standards, uh, things like that. Many of them with artifacts that are software or data in nature. Uh, and uh, those are the important outputs that come from these things. Uh, and there is also other stuff within other, other aspects of the NSF portfolio that are relevant to geoscience as well. And one of the key challenges has always been with regards to these things is the regards to outreach and exposure and kind of the preservation of these uh, software or data artifacts so that they're reused so that post funding these things kind of can live on and be useful to the scientific community. Uh, with regards to exposure also there's you know aspects of re reducing duplications of efforts uh, and uh, there's with regards to longevity there's aspects of, uh, of packaging these things so they're runnable and well documented and so forth so a big part of the office, I think, ever since uh, its beginnings, uh, even prior to our office, has been how to address this and, and what to do with it. And this isn't unique to EarthCube at all. This is across science, but with, for us, within geoscience. So there's been a number of activities to address this. Uh, we've, uh, the previous offices have put together a tools inventory to catalog some of the EarthCube funded activities. Uh, there's been work with Ilya Zavzlovsky and Steve Richards and Dave Valentine to put together this uh, resource registry to kind of catalog everything of relevance to geoscience. Uh, there are some challenges with regards to these approaches in, in regards to this need for the central body to kind of manage these things and gather these. And that's always a concern with regards to sustainability. So that's on the tools front. Uh, and I'll touch more on the tools front in, in the later plenary about the notebooks, which addresses on that even further. Uh, but then on the data front, there's this uh, uh, effort called geocodes. And uh, again, this was started by the previous office. And the idea here is really with regards to the different data repositories out there that hold data relevant to geoscience and the ability for the community to access and discover that data and, and do stuff with that data. The idea was to do something that's really analogous to what Google is for the web, uh, to kind of put together what is needed in the back end so that these data repositories can be crawled. So that something out there can search through all these different repositories, build an index so that you can know what's out there and then have this nice user interface portal, kind of like a Google thing, uh, where a user could just go to this one spot and find the data sets that they want. So the previous office prototyped this. There was a lot of work with uh, what is referred to as the Council of Data Facilities. These are the repositories that house a good chunk of geoscience data. And what it, in the, they don't dig too deeply into this slide, but this kind of is just what is required to do that is this uh, a thing called Science on Schema, which is based on schema.org, is these web annotations that you attach to your data repository web pages that allows them to be crawled. Uh, and so there was a lot of work to kind of uh, build that out within these different CDF repositories so that a prototype could be stood up uh, and uh, demonstrated in terms of what's possible if, if folks adopted this, this kind of approach. And this is analogous again to the web with the idea of, you know, uh, adopting standards like HTML or HTTP or, or TCP IP. This is what makes the internet an internet. You know, you can have different browsers and different web servers and everything just still works. And that's what we're trying to do here for geoscience and the data around it. So with regards to us and our new activity within this office, uh, we were charged with a couple of uh, tasks. One was to kind of take that prototype to the next level, uh, make it uh, more production ready, uh, deploy it for broader use. Uh, uh, one of the aspects that we've been trying to deal with for a while as well as the tools, as mentioned before, and one of the things we wanted to do with regards to our work with geocodes and the data was tools and data really go together. Uh, you need both. Uh, and that's more and more the case these days with regards to science, presenting the tools along with the data. So one of the things we explored was, could we incorporate the two? Could we put the tools and the data get together within the same portal? So basically the information within the resource registry at this point. And lastly, UI UX. So this is something that I think is often overlooked within science. Uh, the idea of the user experience and the user interface are as important aspects and beyond just art. Uh, it's all about simplicity, being able to navigate uh, an interface intuitively. Uh, and it's a, it, it really is a science behind it as well. And so we were fortunate enough to bring on a UI UX uh, uh, designer uh, and her student Summer to work with us on this to kind of lay out the next uh, interface for geocodes. So this is the design that they came up with. And what I'm gonna do now is just kind of go into the beta instance of this uh, and show folks what this uh, looks like. Um, I'm assuming folks can see my browser. Uh, if not, please let me know. Looks so great, this is yeah. the, yeah, all it's good, Christine? Okay. So I'll just do a quick search here for something uh, simple. So hydrology, 
Uh, and so I type in my search, simple little interface to, uh, to just combine and begin your search. And then what you get presented with are data sets on the side here and tools mixed together actually uh, from the various CDF repositories. They're all, so they're all uh, uh, indexed. And so the search results come from all of those things. On the left here, we have what uh, are the various facets to kind of find your search, and, and uh, uh, some of them are collapsed to kind of minimize, you know, the information overload. But what you'll see here is uh, there is data and tools. So you, if you click on the tools, you'll see that there's one tool in this particular case. Um, but uh, uh, there are mi mixed in, into this both of those aspects of things. Um, and so there's other facets you can search on keywords for various things and filter on those and combine those uh, locations, uh, the publishing repository, years published, and so forth. So a couple of examples that we put together are some possible queries. So one was, uh, you know, perhaps a researcher is looking for high resolution LIDAR data of the July 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake sequence in order to study surface ruptures and ground failure features. So doing that kind of query, um, uh, they'll get uh, these results and they'll pop up shortly. <clears throat> Unless everybody's hitting the system at once, in which case it'll take a minute. <laughs> there we go. And so again, there'll be a mixture of data and tools here. And what, what I want to highlight what is these examples that you see right here. So you see these data sets are marked by these little bullets with data and tools with little bullets say tools. But there's in, in addition, these uh, additional bullets that say connected tools. And these, what these are, are, are basically tools that are associated with the data set. So if you click on the data set, you'll get you know, the metadata about it, uh, uh, the location. Uh, and if you scroll down, uh, what you'll see are these connected tools. And so in this case, there's a, a few of them. And if you click on each one, you can get some more information about them. Uh, if you click on the tool metadata, you'll actually pull up what was in the resource registry in terms of the metadata around that. So you can see, you know, other aspects of it as well. Uh, and if I go back, uh, I could go to this, what it says, the download button. It'll take me to the web page where I actually could get this tool. So in this particular example, this is a tool that you would download and install on your uh, operating system. So let me just show you one other quick example of a different kind of tool. So in this case, I'll, I'll do a search for uh, a use case where perhaps I'm finding the temperature uh, or recorded by pollen in lake sediments in Southern Norway. Um, and so I do a search there. And if I, again, I'll get a bunch of data and tools. And if I go to this one with connected tools and scroll down, I'll see a different kind of connected tool, web applications. So in this case, again, you could click on it to get more information, but if you click on open tool instead of download, it'll actually take you to the tool and in this case, pre-populated with the data set that I had uh, searched for within Geocodes. There's a few errors. There's a lot of data cleaning that we're still working on with regards to uh, putting things together. But this is sort of a proof of concept of what's possible, the idea of you know, leveraging tools and data at the same, uh, the same time. Uh, I, I want to show one more thing really quickly. Is one, of, one of the things we are working on uh, is also this idea of, oh, let me find my window here, um, this idea of connected data sets. So with regards to these searches, what we're prototyping right now is, is through the metadata and metadata around various data sets, can we also uh, suggest data sets that are similar and might be of interest to the user during their search? So we, we have a simple approach set up at the moment that's just based on metadata surrounding these data sets, but you can try it out uh, and, and, and see how it works. Uh, this was a at the request of the leadership council in regards to something that might be useful for the scientific community. So there's a prototype in place with regards to that, and it's what we're working on actively um, right now. So you're, feel free to try this. You can go here to beta.geocodes.earthcube.org and, uh, and try it for yourself uh, um, there. Uh, another thing we're working on is uh, actively is uh, other sources for these tool, uh, information around tools. And so, as I mentioned, we're leveraging the resource registry and the, the, lots of the work that's been done there by Ilya and others. Um, one of the other things we're looking at is the work by Simon Goring uh, on his effort called Throughput. And what this does is it basically call, crawls GitHub repositories to find uh, software and associated data sets to that software. So we're working with him on that. Uh, we've interfaced with his API for that system and uh, we're beginning to pull in some of that data. And so this is ongoing work as well. But the idea here is to further flesh out the amount of tools that are associated um, um, with data sets. So I'm gonna end with this last slide here and just mention that uh, one of the uh, things that's come out of uh, um, the Eco Office and uh, largely led by the Leadership Council with some contributions from the Eco Office is this uh, specifications document with regards to uh, products of EarthCube, things they should uh, try to do in order to make them more reusable, increase exposure and so forth. And this touches on every aspect of what we're doing on the tech side, for example, geocodes uh, and also the notebooks uh, that I'll mention in a later session as mentioned. 
Um, and so please take a look at this with regards to your activities. Uh, there's uh, important details with regards to just getting these tools out there and, and brought more broadly used. Uh, with regards to geocodes, it touches on, for example, making sure data sets are in one of those CDF repositories, for example, either that or supporting science on schema. So I'll conclude there and hand it back to Christine. Thank you so much, Kenton. We did have uh, one uh, question that came in for Mimi, if I can ask you. She asks, is the header code inserted for geocodes something that anyone can insert into a data set they're publishing or something that a repository would do? Uh, so I I'll leave it to some of the tech folks to refine what I say. But uh, yes, uh, anybody can do this. Uh, usually, I think what the approach is, you write some code that kind of auto-populates the, the headers for you on these uh, uh, portals. Um, but anybody can do this. Uh, and so we worked with the, the previous office, worked with the CDF repositories to kind of implement this for each of their technologies. Um, but it's not exclusive to them at all. Super. Um, and if you have other questions, feel free to put them in the chat for Kenton. We will um, answer them in text and we'll take ones at the end as time allows. So with that, I'd like to thank Kenton and turn it over to Mike Daniels. If you haven't had a chance to meet Mike, especially those of you who are first time to the EarthCube annual meeting, Mike is our leadership council chair and just an incredible and wonderful person to work with. So you will want to get to know him. Oh, thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, I was looking over the participant list and uh, realizing, boy, it's been a long time since I've seen uh, some of you and and I'd especially like to meet some of the some, some of the new folks but uh, so what a year it's been and it's exciting to see things opening up a bit um, I'm going to try to cover uh, as course of course we can re work remotely like many other uh, uh, you know, organizations have and so I'm going to try to cover very briefly the um, the uh, happenings in the EarthCube governance uh, community um, for those that don't know this is the structure of the EarthCube governance um, there's the leadership council which is made up of chairs of each of these uh, technical committees, uh, except for the uh, Council of Funded Projects, um, as well as some at-large members, an early career member, um, an early career person as, as well. And so um, this is the makeup of the uh, EarthCube governance structure. It's uh, elected by the community for the chairs and then uh, volunteer participation for, from a lot of folks. Oh, I gotta move my... Um, this is the current makeup of the Leadership Council. Uh, as you know, if you uh, followed EarthCube and, and received the emails, we just had an election. So uh, there'll be a new Leadership Council transitioning actually after this meeting. So um, the, the folks I want to thank in particular are Jed, Brown, and, and Masa, uh, uh, who are leaving the Leadership Council for this um, cycle. And, um, and then we're starting a new leadership council, which is, which is made up here. So I wanna welcome, um, you know, Leah and, and Stephen, as well as returning members, Dave, um, uh, Denise and Isabel for, for the 2021-2022 leadership council uh, going forward. Uh, as far as leadership council highlights, uh, some of the things we've done, this is just a short list, is uh, approval and oversight of these 2020 and 2021 working group proposals. So essentially, they're very low overhead ways to get some work done in EarthCube and get compensated for that work, bring in experts um, and, and uh, you know, use some uh, modest funds to, to accomplish some work. And I'll be talking about uh, you know, giving examples of what these working groups did over the past year. Um, we do a lot of information exchange among the governance committee, making sure that everybody's on the same page and keeping track of the um, of the work that's happening in the committees and sharing it with the, with the other leadership council members and therefore the committees. Um, we do a lot of discussions with EarthCube on core initiatives, uh, core EarthCube initiatives such as geocodes, uh, the AGU, FAIR, website for, uh, formatting, uh, a, uh, annual meeting planning, and th those sorts of things. And then we participated this year in the NSF review of EarthCube of the EarthCube office, which, as Christine said, went very well for the, for the office, and well deserved. Um, now we're we're also beginning EarthCube sustainability discussions. Um, we you, you, you'll you'll find that we're going to be listening to the community during this meeting, but we're also uh, talking with the program managers at, at NSF about the important parts of EarthCube that uh, need to be sustained uh, moving forward. And then next, um, we're going to actually have a sustainability plan and report coming this year. So um, th this this meeting is really important for getting the community feedback on that on that report and, and inputs. Um, then then uh, in in this final year of the EarthCube office, we'll be implementing their um, year three budget, and uh, we have in that proposal an, an opportunity for new working groups uh, to be formed, uh, pending approval from NSF. 
So talking about the 2020 and 2021 um, Earth Cube uh, working groups, first one is uh, justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, and Denise Hills was the leader of that. It looks like that's chopped off of the screen. I'm sorry about that. But um, you know, basically, they they looked at community participation guidelines, and um, we'll actually have Denise, uh, you know, give you a full report of that uh, following my talk here. There's a lot of synergies between this um, the, this group's work and the um, Earth Science Information Partners' work. So um, the community is moving in a common direction regarding these issues, and they're they're obviously very important. And we're not going to get good science unless we, unless we address these kinds of things. And um, it, it will just improve the creativity and the and, and the um, you know, our outputs of science uh, tremendously. Um, we also have a learning communities working group. Uh, this is ongoing right now. Um, they're reaching out broadly to members of the geoscience community, particularly focused on um, on science that are that cross the boundaries of disciplines or subdisciplines. Um, they're in establishing an EarthCube Learning Communities Fellows for creating notebook tutorials on data analysis methods this year. So um, I believe that was announced in the um, newsletter. So uh, please please uh, follow that if you can. Um, and then another uh, completed working group was on engagement and training of EarthCube initiatives. So there's a whole set of templates now for um, for for you know providing training for the tools that you've developed with within EarthCube, including a registration form, a um, agenda website, um, a, a follow up uh, survey afterwards. So this group completed that work, and all of those all of these assets are um, are. Um, on the uh, EarthCube website to, to be used. So um, the first project was the Accelerating Science, let's see, Accelerating, oh, right, this is my, Accelerating Scientific Workflows Using EarthCube Tools or Asset project. And so you can see an example of what was done for that project here on the, on the link below. Um, and then finally, there's the Sustainability Working Group. This is a key topic. Um, the, the Sustainability Working Group is overseen by the Council of Funded Projects, or they're, they're the liaison for it. They created a cohort of 10 people uh, called the Sustainability Initiative Group, SIG, and, and they're focusing on both project sustainability and, and larger sustainability issues. They'll have uh, four key interviews with um, sustainability experts going forward, and then are, are doing some initial work on a sustainability report. Um, so that's an ongoing initiative as well for this um, this coming year. Um, as far as the committee work, uh, the science engagement team has developed this source, uh, this open source templates for training workshops that I talked about through the um, through the working group. Um, they've also begun the development of, of the Geoscience 2020 revisited document to sort of set a roadmap for geo uh, geoscience, uh, you know, in the in the future. And then they've led the development of the community, particip community participation guidelines that you'll hear um, Denise talk about soon. The Technology and Architecture Committee has, uh, you know, had a lot of discussions about this document that uh, Kenton referred to, the EarthCube project specifications uh, documents. Um, they, they also get a lot of um, interaction with the, with the technical team from ECO on geocodes in, in terms of how to improve it and then how to implement it. And, and so there have been several talks from, uh, uh, from, the, from the office to the, to the technical, Technology and Architecture Committee relating to geocodes. Um, they are the, the leaders of the notebook submissions at both the AGU and then the uh, annual meeting. And this year there was, there was a, a new request to um, not just focus on, uh, on Python notebooks, but also R and uh, MATLAB uh, you know, notebooks going forward. So they um, are, are working on ways to include those in, in their uh, suite of, uh, of work there. And then I talked about the annual meeting for, for, for the notebooks session in 2021. We had a really great turnout and uh, I can't wait to hear some of the, um, some of the talks in the next session uh, about notebooks. Um, next, uh, we've been uh, recommended that they work closer with the community of funded projects. So they'll be building stronger collaborations with the CFP going, going forward. For the Council of Data Facilities, um, they're, they're really promoting geocodes adoption in some of these large centers. Now, of course, these span um, agencies, government agencies, is, which is really cool. And so the uh, adoption of geocodes um, includes these other agencies. And so the Council of Data Facilities is leading that effort. Um, they also have a continued discussions about the shared infrastructure that's underlying um, the geocodes um, you know, platform itself. And then coming up, they're going to be working on a plan of the CDF Beyond Earth Cube, and then establishing a speaker series to reach out to other communities um, going forward. 
for the Council of Funded Projects. Uh, they, they spent a lot of time working on the EarthKey project specifications document that uh, Kenton talked about. Uh, they're doing a lot of um, project presentations. So most EarthKey projects, when they start, are, um, are automatically members of the Council of Funded Projects. And so uh, in order to initi initiate everybody to your project, they ask for presentations on what your project is about. And then also this year, we um, asked them to talk about sustainability plans for their project. Um, they're the liaison with this uh, sustainability initiative group I talked to you about uh, previously. And then coming up, they're going to be building stronger collaborations with the TAC uh, going forward. Um, so then in terms of this broader sustainability of EarthCube, uh, you know, the really cool thing that's happened is we've spoken to four NSF program managers in, in various domains uh, thus far, and we have plans to speak to uh, additional um, uh, NSF program managers in the fall. I think some highlights of, of those discussions I'll just share here that, of course, are not finished. But um, they noted that um, NSF is not really set up to do you know, to fund sustainable um, projects through the grant process. A lot of times they're, um, they're you know, these projects are, are integrated into, um, you know, uh, FFRDCs or base kind of activities. FFRDCs are federally funded research development centers. And so their recommendation is for, for these projects to, um, as, as much as possible, become indispensable for the community, and then also open up their funding sources to, to go beyond NSF to keep um, things developed, re realizing that that's going to change the mission of these projects because uh, each each uh, funding sponsor will have some some needs you know in terms of um, what what they fund um, the NSF also says that uh, geocodes and fair principles are very important to future science proposals which is great you saw the demonstration and it's just you think about you know 10 years ago being able to do something like uh, what what uh, Kenton demonstrated it's, it's just really cool to see this uh, come and, and then you know the fact that it goes across agencies and and the academic community is is even cooler so um, NSF recognizes that these are important um, uh, to future science proposals. I think another interesting comment that came from the program managers is that NSF uh, uh, GEO has, has noticed higher quality proposals in regards to data issues since the formation of EarthCube. So the community is really pushing uh, more data savvy um, professionals within the science proposals themselves, which I think is a great win for us. And, um, and that's been recognized by NSF. And then it was pointed out that uh, many of NSF's, uh, you know, large and new initiatives like Harnessing the Data Revolution or HDR also have, you know, key data science components. And so, you know, piggybacking onto that and, and, and evolving into from EarthCube into that is, is a real key, um, you know, uh, uh, direction for us. And of course, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data-driven science are all future trends that the NSF sees um, you know, going forward. So um, I want to especially uh, invite uh, the new members to join the, the uh, governance committees. Um, if you just go to this website, um, uh, you know, earthcube.org slash governance, you'll see more information about each of these uh, groups that I talked about, including their meeting times, um, their telecon links, and, and, and the like. And so um, I, I want to thank everybody for, um, for their participation over the past year, and then welcome some uh, of the new members to um, to governance uh, going forward in the, in the coming year. And with that, um, here's my email address uh, uh, that you can correspond to, with me with. And I'd like to uh, introduce Denise Hills to talk about the EarthCube um, uh, justice, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion uh, work that we've done. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Give me just a second to share my screen. Uh, here we go. Share. All right, you see my slides? Perfect. Excellent, excellent. Um, thank you uh, for being here. I am so excited uh, for the number of attendees we have uh, present. Um, I wanted to start with a few acknowledgements. Uh, first, um, I want to do a, la a land acknowledgement. I want to uh, acknowledge that I'm presenting today from the original homelands of uh, the Muskegee Creek Indian Nation. Many Muskegee were removed forcibly by the US government as a part of the Trail of Tears. Only half of those removed survived to reach Indian territory. Those who remained have become a distinct tribe unto themselves, the Porch Creek Indians, the only federally recognized tribe in the state of Alabama. Uh, 
Make this acknowledgement to honor those who lived here before and to recognize the role of my ancestors in the genocide of those people. As part of my efforts to be more inclusive and welcoming, I must acknowledge the injustices of the past so I may assist in restoring justice moving forward. And so that leads to the work uh, of um, the working group, uh, the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Working Group, uh, that um, the 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 leadership council and governance decided was so important to do. We were given many charges, um, but we decided to focus on the community participation guidelines. Uh, and also, I want to acknowledge uh, Masa Baranovich, my co-chair, uh, Simon Coring, uh, Isabella Cruz, Emmanuel Ninju, uh, Sarah Stamps, and Steve Diggs, the other members of this um, working group. We would not have been able to um, get this together into such a, a strong document without uh, their participation and support. So what are the, ESA, the Earth Cube community participation guidelines? Earth Cube recently adopted these uh, community participation guidelines. And as Christine mentioned, we chose to do community participation guidelines uh, because really the heart of the, <laughs> sorry, my cat really wants to be part of this. The heart of Earth Cube is people. EarthCube puts people first and tries their best to recognize, appreciate, and respect the diversity of our global con contributors. So we chose to do community participation guidelines rather than a code of conduct because, um, and I'll often refer to this as CPG, CPG outlines not only what is unacceptable and consequences of that unacceptable behavior, but also helps promote acceptable behaviors um, and encourages those uh, acceptable behaviors. So this, a, a community, the community participation guidelines allows us to be proactive instead of solely reactive. And that was, uh, that was a very conscious choice for us to do. I hope you all have read the community participation guidelines. Um, you at least had to acknowledge that you did when you registered for the conference. Uh, there are both, uh, you can make a, an in informal report or a formal report. Um, informal reports would be, uh, you know, talking with someone from the eco office, uh, speaking with another EarthCube leader, such as Mike Daniels or myself, or somebody else trusted within the community and raise your current concerns in a little bit more informal method. However, we also do use, uh, we've contracted with um, a company called Integrity Counts. They are a third party whistleblower service where you can make uh, an anonymous, anonymous or semi-anonymous report, as well as you're able to um, exclude certain people from ever being able to see that report. Uh, and it provides a level of protection for both you and for the process. There's a lot of transparency built in as well, uh, as well as um, we are going to be very agile in how we address these reports. Um, reports are always going to be taken seriously, no matter, even if you think it is just a very minor thing. Please feel comfortable in reporting it because we want to make sure that everybody not only feels welcome but included uh, on every level. So, but we are also going to uh, try to address uh, any report with compassion and education. Um, this doesn't mean that we're not taking them seriously because, of course, we are. And if there is um, an egregious complaint, of course, it's going to be handled uh, appropriately. But we're also hoping to change the, the culture within geosciences, but we're going to focus on EarthCube for right now. And that compassion and education will help facilitate that overall cultural change. Kind of uh, future looking, uh, as well as kind of what our CPG has inspired, the effort was uh, specifically recognized in the midterm mid review panel uh, with, this, with this paragraph. The ECO's efforts to develop and implement a DEI statement and community guidelines document are especially notable. Ensuring the JEDI statement is included at the start of each EC meeting helps to infuse cultural change across the EC governance and broader community. The review team felt this activity was an excellent display of inclusiveness with the broader EC community, leadership in achieving sustainable consensus with the stakeholders, accountability with respect to the expectations for engagement, and transparency of process. Uh, 
Our CPG also has had uh, impact beyond EarthQ. Um, it has been already modified for use in lab groups and workshops, and GoFair is in the process of adapting to their needs. I must also, I forgot to acknowledge this at the beginning, um, these CPG were modeled off um, community participation guidelines uh, recently uh, developed and adopted by ESIP, which were uh, modified and uh, from community participation guidelines that were put out by Mozilla. Um, so we are building on the work of others and others are building on the work of us. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions now or privately, um, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Denise. And thank you also for all the good work you and the committee have done EarthCube is very, very lucky to have people like you that can help us get to this, uh, this next level. And I also know that um, our version of the CPG is being used by other organizations. So kudos to you and to, to ESIP, who we built upon. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Keith Mall and Matt Mayernick, who are going to talk about um, EarthCube scholarly impact and what they've been up to. Okay, how about now? Good. Hopefully you can see my screen. So my name is Keith Mall, and um, I believe my colleague, uh, Matt Mayernick, who's been working with me on this project, is also on the line. I'm going to make sure I start my timer so that, so that I'm aware of, of my time. So uh, today's presentation uh, will be about uh, an update on the uh, metrics project that Matt and I have been working on, centered around mostly uh, publications and processes and understanding the impact of the EarthQ project from that perspective. But I will, in the next slide, sort of uh, uh, give some information about um, uh, you know, how we hopefully intend to uh, uh, deal with other parts of the project that aren't necessarily represented in the publications. All right, so let's see. OK, so what is this project? Um, ultimately, um, you know, the, the goal of this project is to understand the outputs of the EarthCube project over the, you know, the, since the inception of, of the uh, uh, funding. And um, we are aware that uh, publications are, you know, uh, the uh, gold standard, if you will, for assessing scholarly impact at the very least. Um, but we also acknowledge that um, there are a variety of other assets that are produced out of projects, and especially this is true in the EarthCube space where we have, uh, as mentioned earlier with, with uh, Kenton and Mike's talk, um, we have papers in addition to software data and other project outputs. Um, so we are aware that those are outputs that we need to be thinking about, uh, but the scope of this presentation will be limited to publications for now. And um, why are we doing this? Um, you know, ultimately, we we want to understand the contribution of this project from the lens of publications first, and then we're going to fan out into some of these other outputs and start to see just exactly what and how we might uh, uh, assess impact from the lens of these other of these other things. But we are really uh, interested in understanding how uh, what we learn from this can help drive community activities and decision making. Uh, and we're also interested in thinking about what uh, types of metrics frameworks you might be able to insert into future processes. The other thing is that is that everyone likes to see, you know, what has happened in the past. Um, you know, nothing is more satisfying uh, than to look at papers that you or your colleagues have written and see citation counts steadily increase over time. Yeah, so this historical view is, is important, not only for, I, I guess, maybe our egos, but also it does give us some real uh, tangible things to think about in terms of where the project or, or where the program has come. Okay, so in turn, in, within the scope of, of the data I'm going to talk about today, um, the uh, inputs that we uh, utilized for this analysis were the awards from 2013 to 2020. And what we did is we extracted all of these self-reported publications by the PIs as identified through the NSF reporting mechanism. So uh, the NSF database, which uh, all the PIs here are familiar with, 
that requires annual reports. And in those annual reports, uh, there are inquiries as to the publications and other, uh, mostly publications and other things that you have produced as a result of your funding. Um, we've extracted that from the NSF database and um, proceeded to accumulate the DOIs for those citations uh, and for those publications. And from that, we develop a uh, mechanism for analyzing the entire scope of, of what comes out of that. Um, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go over all of the details. These slides will be available, so if you want to see those or ask me questions later. But we are using a number of other tools. Uh, again, you know, we're, we're, the input is coming from the NSF directly, uh, but we are using uh, Crossref, Clarivate, Scopus Dimensions. Uh, we use GitHub and Datasite to uh, start analyzing some of the uh, both repository activity and the uh, data set DOIs, uh, which we're just starting to get into um, some of the details about um, how we're going to do those analyses. Today's analysis, though, will be based on uh, data that we extracted from the cross -rep. Okay, um, one of the things about, uh, you know, what I'm about to present, I wanted to give some methodological caveats about it. Um, if we look at the space of, of all publications, all self-reported publications on the outer ring, um, you know, everyone knows that, uh, you know, there are issues with uh, self-reporting. Maybe you forgot to uh, add a publication um, maybe at the time that uh, the publication data was extracted, it was out of date with reality. Um, but ultimately, um, as we move into our analysis phases, um, the number of publications narrows and narrows. So we have these, the, the universe of, so, well, you know, there's really a universe outside of this of all, all publications, but let's just talk narrowly about the self-reported publications. And then we have publications with DOIs, and then we narrow that even uh, further with the publications that are indexed by the data sources that we use. This is an important, uh, uh, you know, um, point to bring up in this presentation is that not all uh, publications, not all DOIs are indexed by all services. And um, we do see discrepancies, and that's one of the reasons why we use as many tools as we do. But um, at the end of the day, what we need to realize is that no analysis can cover everything. And so we know that this is not 100% complete, um, but it, it, it is a, I think that it is a fairly good representation of reality. Okay, so with respect to traditional bibliometrics, I think everyone uh, more or less understands that we've got citation counts, we've got publication venues, we have our, uh, authorship profiles. And these are some of the things that we are looking at as we uh, you know, navigate through the analysis. Um, as we look at the relationship that we've had, which is, you know, sort of been going on for a while, since about 2017, we started with uh, a small uh, trial of uh, looking at the publications that were coming out of the program. In 2018, we began to start looking at software uh, contributions, and that was uh, a, an interesting analysis of some of the GitHub uh, repositories, which we are in the process of trying to refresh. And then um, in 2019, we did a refresh of the publications and started to look at um, a few more details there, which leads us to where we are today. So in, um, you know, kind of giving an overview of the summary of our, our uh, EarthCube contributions, again, the time scale 2013 to 20, um, this uh, encompasses about 78 uh, NSF awards of over 46 distinct projects. Uh, 20 of those were collaborative, uh, which, you know, I can, I'll let the community think about that and the importance of it, actually. And then uh, we have a, 168 unique papers. And again, the, the asterisk here is just to pinpoint the idea that these are papers that we were able to extract from the NSF uh, uh, reports uh, database from which we were able to extract the DOI. So again, some of those did not have DOIs, et cetera. Uh, we analyzed those 168 papers, ended up with 2,600 citations, and that's about as current as we can get within the last uh, four weeks or so. And uh, that uh, gives us about an average of 15.48 citations per paper, which is actually quite good. Um, this ends up uh, letting our focus uh, fall into about 85 unique journals. And we can see sort of the top five journals. 
for most in the, who are not new to the community, these are probably not surprises that uh, these are the accumulated papers in each one of these. Of course, as you might realize, there's a very long tail here. And, um, you know, that's just to be expected from the kind of data that we're working with. Okay, so looking at the most cited papers in this time span, again, these citation counts are um, current as of about the last month. Um, the most cited paper uh, comes from the iTest uh, project, the Big Data and Cloud Computing Innovation Opportunities and Challenges. Um, for those of you who are in that project or related to it or had worked on it, um, you, you know, you should be proud that, that that's a, you know, a very uh, important accomplishment, I suppose, in terms of uh, set your citation counts. Um, and then we can sort of move, move down to uh, other papers that end up, uh, you know, getting highly cited um, over the course of the, uh, the program. Um, if we look at this particular cut, we have a project summary cut here, which just basically sorts the projects by by total number of papers produced in, in those projects. And again, for many of you who have been in the community for a while, these are probably not new, uh, and you may have uh, some knowledge about, uh, about that. That, that ranking. If we look at this a slightly different way and sort by sites uh, per paper, uh, we, we get a slightly different view. Um, you know, we could have very lengthy discussions about, um, you know, papers, few, a small number of papers getting a large number of citations or a large number of papers getting a small number of citations and everything in between. This gives you a little bit of a different view of the way impact could be viewed uh, if you just change your uh, uh, lens a little bit and look at uh, the lens of sites per paper. All right, I'm on my last slide and it looks like I'm, I, I, I have extinguished my 10 minutes. Uh, if we talk about wh what we're gonna do next. Uh, again, as I said in the very beginning, we do wanna spend some time talking about uh, the additional uh, um, inputs. Uh, software and data are low hanging fruit in this community and we definitely want to try to bring those uh, and bring some light to how those uh, bring the impact picture into uh, you know, clarity. Uh, we do think that um, there is an opportunity to look at some community targeted publication survey to pick up the things that were missed perhaps in those um, NSF reports. Um, again, uh, the not putting those publications in those reports is uh, you know, uh, probably not doing your project the best service because you want to, um, uh, you know, show the, your project and its accomplishments in the best light possible. So I would bet that we would pick up a few, but we probably have pretty good coverage, I think, from what we are extracting from that. Uh, we are also looking at, like I said, you know, uh, methodological ways to connect these outputs and, and uh, you know, different lenses in which we could uh, show program impact and then uh, report that out to the broader community and make that publicly available to everyone. So that's it. Thanks for letting me go over an extra minute or so. And um, if there are any questions that do come through, uh, I'll be happy to take them offline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keith. And we really appreciate the work that you've done to help us understand the scholarly impact and also um, the work that you and Matt are doing, I think will be a great example to other projects on how to measure impact and um, some reusable methods. So with that, I'd, I'd like to introduce Dr. Eva Zanzerkia, our NSF program officer. And if you um, don't realize, Eva's been with EarthCube the whole time. And so all of our accomplishments really think are a reflection of her commitment and interest in this initiative. Thanks, Christine, for that introduction. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so can you see that? Okay. Perfect. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, let me also, uh, on behalf of the Geosciences Cyber Infrastructure Group within NSF, to welcome all of you to this meeting. And that includes the 2020 awardees from the EarthCube program, as well as new attendees, as Christine said. It's amazing how many new people we have here, but also uh, those who have been here with EarthCube for many years, just like me. So uh, like the EarthCube program, our staff at NSF represents the partnership between the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure and all of the divisions of the geosciences. 
which are Earth, ocean, atmosphere, and geospace, and polar programs. So as an initiative, it began in uh, 2011. Um, EarthCube has come a long way from that initial community visioning set of charrettes and the small amount of funding that we had for eagers and workshops. Uh, and here are, are just my um, set of a few accomplishments. You've heard already about a great number of things that EarthCube has done in the past and continues to do, and I can't do justice to all of those. Um, but in over the past 10 years, I'd say perhaps the most significant uh, outcome has been the successful and sustained collaboration between geoscientists and technologists. Um, and we've also seen gains through funded efforts to increase access and interoperability of data that's critical to studying Earth systems, um, as well as the adoption of shared standards and approaches and new methods like notebooks, which I know you're going to hear a lot more about throughout this meeting. And finally, and most impressively for this year, as Mike indicated, EarthCube weathered an unprecedented impact from COVID-19. And for a long time, EarthCube governance has shown how we can work together in a distributed environment. So while there have been lots of challenges for researchers and students, and even the science through the pandemic, our ability to step up um, what EarthCube was already doing, and I'll also highlight the need for shared data and when we can't get into the field or the lab has really been a bright spot. Uh, though I, I, I hope you agree, I, I think it would be nice to have one of these meetings in person again at some point. So the timeline for the official EarthCube program is short. The EarthCube office will soon be in its third and final year of planned support, and the fiscal year 2020 solicitation is the last year of funding for this 10-year program. Um, awardees from that round will be announced uh, in early fall, so stay tuned for that. Um, and I know there will be discuss discussions about the uh, legacy of EarthCube and its next steps throughout this meeting and from what you've already heard. So as you've already um, also heard from Christine and Mike um, and Denise, uh, this past year also saw a midterm review for the EarthCube office uh, that touches on several of those points. And uh, as you also heard, overall the office and the work that the EarthCube community have done were viewed very positively and that the um, co core responsibilities of the office have been managed very effectively. And so I've summarized here just three of the recommendations in the report, um, which all in some way acknowledge and respond to the end of EarthCube uh, as a program. Uh, most significantly, the panel recommends that EarthCube through the office develop a strategic effort for sustainability for EarthCube activities. Uh, this includes a release schedule, uh, for our geocodes to promote the broad adoption across the geosciences of these standards, uh, as well as exploring partnerships and integration with other activities that can include ESIP, professional societies, other facilities. And I know that this question of sustainability and how to achieve it are not easy. There's no quick answers or guarantees that everything that should continue to exist will be able to, at least in the form that we know of it in now. And so I know that the upcoming year and discussions will be really critical for this community. And all of these activities will require close collaboration and involvement of all of the aspects of EarthCube governance, our data facilities, and the community at large. So from the NSF side, things are changing and new initiatives and opportunities are continually emerging. Our hope is that through this year, we can work with the EarthCube community to communicate these opportunities uh, in a way that is uh, beneficial to you. So I'd like to spend the rest of this talk outlining some of these changes in the federal level and the anticipated impacts on NSF and what this might mean for the Geosciences Directorate at NSF and its focus. And finally, um, I'll talk about some of the investment opportunities and priorities for the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. As I said, they're our partner in this effort. So first is that we have a new administration, and that is changing the prominence of science in the federal landscape. Uh, one example is that the Office of Science and Technology is now a cabinet level department. And we anticipate that this will lead to more focus, not just on NSF, but support for science across all federal agencies. Uh, the administration um, has also articulated four urgent out-of-the-gate priorities, uh, which includes addressing COVID-19, racial justice, again at NSF, like you've heard in Earth, EarthCube, 
uh, we call this JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Uh, the other um, priorities are economic recovery and, of course, climate change. And the last one is one that will have significant impacts on the geosciences, as I'll describe next. So to emphasize the importance of investing in uh, R&D, er earlier this spring, the administration released a white paper describing new a new investment plan. This plan includes a call to Congress to increase the investment in NSF by $15 billion and to create a new technology directorate to improve US leadership in new technologies. Uh, the details of this are still to be worked out and agreed to by Congress. Um, but I'll talk a little about how this has impacted NSF plans already. Oops, excuse me. So those administration priorities dovetail really well with the goals of the NSF director, Satraman Panchanathan, who has emphasized the importance of partnerships to achieve three pillars for the future of US research. These pillars are to advance the frontiers of research, to ensure accessibility and inclusivity in science and to secure global leadership. And so you can very clearly see how these are well aligned with the administration priorities. Which leads us to the fiscal year 2022 presidential budget request for NSF. This request would make NSF a $10 billion agency for the very first time. And this is a significant thing. You put in another level of of um, visibility and oversight at that budget level. Uh, the emphasis for this increase is on climate science and sustainability, uh, increases to fundamental research, advancing uh, racial equity, and this new directorate for technology and in innovation, as well as continued investment in the construction of major research facilities. So let me focus on the climate theme from the budget request. This sets a clear direction and emphasis for the geosciences and its investments in the next several year. And the geo directorate will lead NSF's efforts in this arena. Um, we've organized around the US GCRP investment themes, uh, which cross cut the domains of geosciences. These themes are the ocean's role in climate change, terrestrial and climate interactions and water sustainability, the role of the cryosphere, um, understanding and modeling forcings and feedback within the Earth system, and understanding its predictability and resilience. So GEO will emphasize support in these areas for research and infrastructure in the geosciences, an increased investment in the GEO initiative COPE, which stands for Coastlines and People, and through uh, guidance for an anticipated report from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine on Earth system science. So that report, which we expect this year, was commissioned by NSF to describe a compelling vision of how we can advance a systems approach to studying the Earth. That report will identify facilities and infrastructure, including computational data and analytic support that are required for Earth system research, um, as well as planning for future cyber infrastructure. The report will also include scientific coordination mechanisms, and workforce development that's required for meeting the needs of the science. So I urge you to participate in any activities that still remain that are related to this report uh, and to consider its findings when they are released as you think about future plans for EarthCube, its community and sustainability in the future. So now let me quickly turn to uh, planning activities that have occurred for the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. OAC has for the past several years engaged in uh, a strategic visioning exercise. And uh, here's this web link at the bottom of this slide. You can go there um, to get more information on all of the aspects of this planning activity. So the vision that OAC has laid out is for a national cyber infrastructure ecosystem that's agile, integrated, robust, trustworthy, and sustainable uh, with the goal of having that uh, ecosystem drive innovation across all of the science and engineering enterprises. And OAC has set for itself a set of principles to help meet this goal, and that's to take a more holistic view of cyber infrastructure, uh, to support translational research 
from fundamental science to the impact on the scientific community, uh, to acknowledge the need for innovation, as well as the stability of infrastructure for the scientific communities that depend on it, and to more um, closely understand the coupling of um, cycles between cyber infrastructure development and scientific discovery. Um, and finally, as you've heard from even the GeoCodes update we got, to improve usability across this ecosystem. It's uh, so important and often overlooked. Uh, so finally, this vision will be put into practice through a series of investments and opportunities that OAC sees in the future. Uh, some of this is organizing their existing programs with this new view in sight, um, and as well as developing some new potential investments. And so these are divided into these three thematic areas. Uh, the first is for support for CI innovation. Again, this is that translational science that goes from computer science into the development of cyber infrastructure. And that includes developments in advanced computing, cybersecurity, uh, workforce training, um, as, as well as new developments that would impact data and software cyber infrastructure. Uh, the second is to really expand the cyber infrastructure resources that are available at a variety of scales and that are used by all of the scientific community. Uh, these include computing, again, at a variety of scales from distributed high performance computing to, to the scale of uh, clusters. Uh, these resources also include um, network infrastructure and cybersecurity, um, as well as this great program that uh, OAC has for developing centers of excellence which have different foci and can help facilitate the development of cyber infrastructure across a variety of facilities and re other research activities uh, funded by NSF. Uh, and finally, there are these opportunities that look to build collaborations across all of the disciplines. Um, and many of these are programs that you're familiar with, such as uh, CSSI, uh, which help advance science by building robust cyber infrastructure for the scientific community as well as other opportunities such as cyber training for workforce development uh, and the CSER program, which is used for smaller scale emerging efforts in CI, which might not be ready yet for submitting to something like uh, CSSI. Uh, so let me end by uh, reiterating that new cyber infrastructure and geosciences opportunities that are of interest to the EarthCube community will continue to develop at NSF and in other places. And we will continue to try to make those opportunities visible to you. You can always go to this website, which is hosted by GEO, uh, to get a quick view of that landscape and the opportunities that are uh, currently related, uh, available that are related to CI and GEO uh, and that we participate in in each year. And finally, I look forward to talking to you, whether it's as part of EarthCube or part of your own scientific research about ways that we can support what you're doing. Uh, so thank you, and let me turn it back over to Christine. Eva, thanks so much. We have a great question in the chat from Ari Asmi, who you know, and, and thank you, Ari. I know it's 8 or 9 p.m. where you are, <laughs> excuse me. Um, he asks, does NSF see transatlantic collaboration opportunities, e.g. with Horizon Europe missions, in the Earth system, especially giant climate change programs. And he also asks, is there an intent to create new collaborations in the cyber or physical infrastructure in this field? Yeah, both of those are excellent questions. And, and I think the answer to the first about uh, international collaboration, uh, especially for Earth system science is definitely a yes. I think we're not in a unique position in the geosciences or climate research. Um, but, but it's definitely critical for us that we're an international science and these are international and global systems. Uh, and so we definitely see both the value and the need to engage our international partners, both for data sharing uh, and for joint scientific projects. Uh, as as um, climate change as a, as a federal initiative and this new report from the academies comes out, I think we'll see the development of um, more specifics of how we would engage and develop those partnerships. Um, USGCRP itself, I think, has um, always emphasized the importance of our partnerships with um, 
uh, ICPP, uh, IPCC, and other international partnerships. And so I think we, we can uh, be sure that that will continue. Uh, and then, yes, I do believe that for, um, uh, sorry, the, the question uh, disappeared from my screen. So let, let me go back so I make sure that I answer it correctly. Sorry, sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. Um, uh, is there an intent to create new collaborations, in, uh, infrastructure in this field? Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, that's a highlight for GEO is to first to understand the state of the art, both for uh, observing systems, as well as cyber and modeling uh, capabilities that's required sort of to advance Earth system science to the next level. So I think you will definitely see a focus on those areas in, in uh, Earth system science in the future. Great. The next question comes from uh, Pramit Deb Berman, who asks, are there any training or scholarship opportunities available from EarthCube for the ECRs? So I, um, well, ECR, I just want to make sure that I get that acronym correctly. I wasn't sure either and was hoping that you would know it. Um, <laughs> But maybe I'll, I'll just talk about training and uh, scholarship opportunities in general. So in the EarthCube program, uh, we have always encouraged uh, proposals that are submitted there to um, for, for Earth early career researchers. Thanks, Denise uh, and Simon yeah, and Sarah. <laughs> so good. Lots of people knew. Um, yeah, so we've always encouraged uh, early career researchers to participate in proposals that are submitted to EarthCube. Uh, and specifically calling out uh, graduate students and postdoc opportunities. I know that's always been a critical area for uh, the EarthCube governance in the office as well. One of the early um, EarthCube workshops was wholly focused on early career researchers because we understood that, you know, even over the course of the 10 years of the EarthCube initiative, those researchers would be the ones that would be carrying forward um, new innovations in science and any new tools and capabilities that were developed by EarthCube. Um, but I, as I, I noted for Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, um, there are several opportunities. Uh, they, they highlighted, I didn't talk about this, but in their slide, um, they specifically mentioned that they're interested in career proposals. So careers are our foremost opportunity for early career researchers to fund their own research. Um, and Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure definitely supports those opportunities. Thank you so much, Eva. The next question comes from Basil Tikoff, who says, this question is from a Council of Funded Projects perspective. There is a planned sunsetting of the EarthCube office, but new projects will be funded. Is there an NSF vision to how to provide a community for these newly funded projects? Yes, um, that is a great question, and I think one that was that clearly is uh, known in the community. It was also something that was discussed and highlighted in the midterm evaluation. Uh, so I think we're interested in learning from this year of discussions with the community about what you see as um, important to continue and then how we can find ways to continue that. It sounds like uh, the Council of Funded Projects has been a, a really um, excellent emergence from the last few years of governance, and it's something that we'd like to see continue. Um, I think the, what we need to do is see, well, where are there existing um, organizations or opportunities that might be a good fit? And if those don't exist, then what's the next step? Is it something that can be funded through like a research coordination network or some other opportunity? Um, those, I think I'd love to hear what, what the community thinks would be good steps for moving forward. Sure, and maybe on that note, I'll just say that that was also on Chow Wei Phil Yang's mind when they asked, would a potential future EarthCube program engage the new NSF directorate on technology and innovation? I, I hope you all keep an eye out for that. Well, I mean, we are too. We don't know what it's going to look like yet, um, but we do know if you look at on the NSF website, you can find the NSF budget request, which talks a lot about what they might envision for that kind of technology um, directorate. Uh, and so as that develops, I, I do think it would be a great idea for EarthCube to be um, uh, paying attention. Um, several parts, what the, they envision so far as I can tell right now is that it would be a combination of existing activities and new ones. So there are uh, already 
uh, opportunities that are happening in, happening at NSF that will become part of uh, that new directorate. And that includes things like i and IUCRC, which are um, academic and industry partnerships. Uh, so do pay attention to those things that are happening at the foundation and what's going on it, it, and how this new directorate uh, develops. And as we know more, we will definitely try to make those connections between uh, NSF and the EarthCube community. Thanks so much, Eva. And then the uh, last one, there's just a, a thank you to you uh, <laughs> in, in the Q&A there. And so. Well, thanks. Thanks to all of you. I, I really like looking through the attendee list. I, I know so many of you and uh, it's great to have you participate in this meeting. And again, I hope to see you all soon in person someday. Thank you so much, Eva. So now we'll turn to a few logistics, but we do have everyone still on the line. So if you have additional questions, um, we, we can take a few more. But before, before we end, I would like to go over a couple other things that I think will uh, make for an extra fun meeting. Okay, so those of you that are in the US and provided your address, hopefully you received something like this in the mail. Uh, for those of you who did not, uh, all, of the, all of the puzzles are available on our website, as well as the special word search that we held back from printing uh, because we thought it was a little too advanced. But kudos to our EarthCube Office Associate Director, Catherine Kramer, um, who does and is able to do the Saturday New York Times puzzle. And so we challenge those of you who are great at puzzling to check it out. Some of you have already found it, but our Slack channel is a way to engage with your colleagues, especially during the event. And if you haven't introduced yourself, please find the intros channel and let us know who you are and what you're working on. And this is a great way to find collaborators and uh, especially absent of an in-person gathering this year. Uh, we also have a running threaded discussion at the channel EC 2021. Again, for those of you who like Slack, it's there for you. After the conference, it's a quick way to get in touch with any of us at the office, governance members, and colleagues from across the country in geosciences. And you'll find out about um, short fuse opportunities. For example, there's a great one from Deborah Kiter, who posted about the National Academy's workshop next week to identify future paleoclimate research directions and the technolo technological capabilities needed to support that work. So new this year, we have Gathered Town which is specifically where the posters are, and it will be up all three days of the conference. And remember, early career and mentors during coffee and poster sessions, please meet at the beach. Here is our schedule at a glance, and note all of these times here are in Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, this afternoon is all about notebooks, and we will have opportunities for you to see some of the peer-reviewed notebooks demonstrated, as well as to discuss the research and methods they display. And it's not just about Jupiter. We also have people who are gonna talk about R and MATLAB. So please be sure to make that. Tomorrow you have a choice of breakout sessions. And after a short break, we'll head over to Gather Town where the first half of the accepted posters will be presenting. We also have a parallel session in the afternoon that we're calling the Afternoon Affair. And we are partnering with the GoFair US office and the West uh, Big Data Hub to bring you fair workflows presented by Carol Goebel and other colleagues. And right after that, you will hear from Dr. Lydia Jennings about the care principles for indigenous data government. Be sure to come back to our main session where we will hear more about the robotic mapping of a historic dump site from Eric Terrell and Sophia Merrifield. You may have read about it in the Los Angeles Times or any of the other international news outlets that picked it up. You won't want to miss it. On Thursday, we have an optional session an hour before our regular schedule for those who are interested in hearing more about the Open Topo resource. resource. This will be led by EarthCube and CDF member Vishu Nandigam. Again, we'll have your choice of morning sessions, then a short break for you to grab a sandwich and check email, and then be sure to tune back in for the Mars talk from Anna Grau Galfour sorry if I butchered your name, that gives us a view of science on Mars from an Earth scientist perspective. Then follow the following the science talk, we will have the second half of accepted posters again over at Gather Town. A bit more about the breakout uh, sessions. We invite you to choose your own adventure. 
Um, this afternoon, again, two sessions, one on research education and one on demonstrations. Tomorrow, there's a choice between the future of EarthCube listening session. When um, Dr. Zanzerkia um, said she'd like to get your input, this is one of the ways to give input. Uh, NSF always says they, they are responsive to the community, and so it's through listening sessions like this that your voice is raised. Um, but we also have wonderful sessions on geosciences databases and the Jupiter landscape. On Thursday, we will repeat the listening session as well as offer one on GeoAI, a collaborative session sponsored by the Council of Data Facilities for Life After EarthCube, and um, another on the EarthCube graphs. Oh, and, and yes, I did mention GeoAI. To find any of the Zoom links, go to the registration site, and we are also sending out emails every day um, to give you some quick links. You can also find them for those of you who are in Slack. I'd like to acknowledge the work and patience of the community that put our meeting together. First to the notebook organizing committee. They've not only conducted the process of reviewing notebooks and assembling the plenary and breakouts this afternoon, they've had to create the process and in some cases templates and standards as they go. The work you do has impact beyond EarthCube and we all thank you. And thank you to these seven tremendous people. They organize so many aspects Hopefully that's loading for you. There we go. <laughs> they organized so many aspects of the meeting and worked hard to make our time together impactful and relevant. They are also the allies to reach out to if anything goes awry. While we have you and while we're dreaming of being together again, mark your calendar for next June and plan to meet us in San Diego for the 2022 EarthCube meeting. Okay, um, let me just check and see if we have any uh, questions doesn't look like we have anything cute in Q&A. So um, with that, maybe we'll uh, leave for the break a few minutes early. Um, I'd like to introduce the chair of our technical architecture committee, Dave Folker. He is known to bring his trumpet when he travels, just in case he can find a gig or someone to play with. Dave, thanks for taking the gig again. And we would love it if you would play us out to the break. So, um... Uh, it seems that uh, uh, because we've all spent uh, over a year together on the COVID island, uh, I thought perhaps uh, Herbie Hancock's uh, Cantaloupe Island uh, might be an appropriate uh, way for us to, uh, to, to uh, conclude the plenary session. Thank you, Dave. This is awesome. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.